Hello and good evening um, to everyone here. Hello to everyone out in cyberspace. My name is John Davis and I am a historian of modern London. I was until last summer when I retired a fellow of the Queen's College, Oxford, and I suppose I still am uh, in some ways. I'm here to talk about the book that I published four weeks ago today, or Princeton University Press published four weeks ago today, uh, on 1960s and 70s London, called Waterloo Sunrise, London from the 60s to Thatcher. It's a fairly daft title, I know, but uh, it, it, it caught on and it, it, it kind of stuck. Um, <clears throat> It doesn't really tell you what's inside, so that's what I'm aiming to, uh, to do tonight. I used to be a 19th century London historian until some point in the early 90s I saw the light and moved to the post-war period, at a time when very few historians were working on that period. The light that I saw, and this is an unlikely story, but I've, I've given various radio interviews in the last couple of weeks about the book, and... and Interviewers repeatedly ask me, why are you doing this? Because this is a question academics never get asked and never ask themselves, why are you doing what you're doing? That's kind of off limits. But um, I had to think about why I was doing it. And there's an unlikely route to all this, which uh, I've carried in my head for more than 30 years now, that in 1991 I visited Rostock in the former East Germany very shortly after unification. And it was a city which had become kind of frozen in time because of the undynamic nature of the East German regime. Um, and it reminded me overwhelmingly of the London that I'd known as a very young child. I was born in November 1955. Um, so I'm talking really here about the London that the book starts with, circa 1960, which was still a 19th century city pockmarked by war, by the Blitz, and by uh, general deterioration. And Rostock reminded me of that. The London that I just described was a London which had passed during the period that the book covers. The book covers the period in which I grew up in London, but it's not in any sense autobiographical. I think there's just one point in, in the text at which I invoke my own memory of anything. Um, but it is an attempt to capture that process of change that I became aware of when, in the former East Germany, I began to think about how cities transform themselves or are transformed. I should say that this talk consists entirely of illustrations from the book which I am talking around. Uh, and this one gives you some sort of idea, I think. There's a photo by Roger Main of the Harrow Road area around Paddington in 1960. And what we have is not conventional redevelopment, that is knocking down a building to put a new building in its place, but rather a bomb site which has remained untouched until 1960. It looks as if they're doing something with it there, that that's what that lorry is about, but who knows. And a lot of the London that I grew up in uh, looked rather like this, that much of the blitz damage remained unattended to, remained untouched. Um, it was a dirty city, as you can see from this. Um, it was still an industrial city. This is a photo of, uh, taken from the south bank of the Thames, looking across to the city, to Queen Hythe uh, on the north bank. Um, it's just to the east of where the Millennium Bridge, the Wobbly Bridge, is now. If the a uh, photographer had panned slightly further left, he would have caught the dome of St Paul's Cathedral. Uh, for the anoraks, the two wren churches that you can see in the right-hand half of the picture are um, uh, St Mary Somerset, the tower, and St James Garlic Hive, the, the spire. Uh, and, but the reason I put it in is to emphasise that this is, if you know that part of the city now, it does not look anything like that. It's a completely commercialised city with modern glass buildings. Uh, here, it's, this, is, this is Riverside London, this is Warehouse London, this is still Dock London, actually, above the Pool of London, um, commercial London. And this was what the Thames that I used to be 
taken up and down in pleasure boats when I was about five. This is what the Thames looked like, more almost up to Westminster. So it, this is a, a sit, an industrial city with an industrial river. It's still also a dirty city. This is not fog, this is smog. And it's not smog from the famous London smog of 1952, it's smog from the 1962 um, <coughs> pollution. Uh, which was less serious than the one that everyone knows about in 1952, but still, as you can see, pretty unpleasant. This is not stuff you want to breathe in. So the, the London that I could just remember as a very young child was an old city, a decrepit city in a number of ways, a dirty city, a polluted city. And yet, in the mid-60s, of course, as everyone of a certain age will know, it suddenly becomes the trendiest place in the world. Uh, that's not the trendiest place in the world, sorry, I'll move on to the next. Uh, it suddenly becomes the trendiest place in the world. Uh, that is the King's Road in 1966. Um, one of the two main focal points, along with Carnaby Street and West Soho, one of the two main focal points of swing, so-called swinging London. The title sort of emanated from an article in Time magazine in April 1966, which drew attention to the emergence of uh, this supposedly young, vibrant London out of the, uh, from the embers of what had always been regarded as a rather staid and, and um, restrained place. Um, <clears throat> it's... And I, I need, at this point, I think, to say something about the way the book is structured to understand uh, where we go from here. This is an illustration that I've chosen to uh, encapsulate Swinging London. It, that is the theme of the first chapter, but this is not a narrative history. This is a collection of 16 case studies which I've put together over a long period, actually. I'm mean, a good sort of 20 years or so in the writing this book. A collection of 16 case studies which I've put together uh, in order to provide a perhaps slightly kaleidoscopic image of the city. Um, but from the start, I decided, and, and I still feel convinced, that it was not possible. It's certainly not something I could do. It was not possible to produce a linear or narrative history of a place as diverse and complex as modern London was. Uh, so each of the 16 chapters is freestanding. Each can be read on its own. If anyone is tempted to fork out £30 for it or £22.99 on Amazon, uh, you, don't, you can feel assured that you don't have to read the whole thing. Uh, you can dip into the ones that interest you and, uh, and ignore the rest. I hope they all interest you. But this was a deliberate choice to uh, try and capture an image of the city by means of a number of self-contained case studies. And that's what I've done. And the first of them looks at the kind of rapid transformation process that's being commented on by a, a number of largely foreign observers in the mid-60s, what I call the swinging London phenomenon. I actually call it the swinging moment for reasons which I'll go into in a minute. Um, I'm, not a, I'm not one of those, a lot of historians will say it never happened or it only happened for a kind of elite group that the what you might call the old school London elite. You can see behind me in David Hearn's splendid picture of the 1967 Queen Charlotte Ball, uh, the people who had been denizens of the London season, the West End aristocracy, just kind of loosen up a bit and instead uh, take to swinging this, take to pop music, take to modern fashions and so on. And the, what's known as swinging London was really only uh, a phenomenon of Soho, Chelsea, and some very rich people. I never quite bought into that. It's a product of a certain sort of nihilism that historians practice, and I don't really want to sign up for it. I did live through this. I wasn't part of it. I was too young to be a part of it. But I did live through this period. And I'm aware that something happened. It wasn't just the preserve of, uh, of 
the people who are playing out the last few years of the London season here, um, they might have parted more extravagantly and more, um, un- more relentlessly than, uh, than others. And of course it's true that the average Londoner had to eat, sleep, live, work, commute, etc., uh, and couldn't spend all his or her time partying. But something was going on in the cultural scene of the mid-60s, in popular music and in fashion, and I think it, it does nobody any favours really to uh, try and erase it. The reason I call it the swinging moment um, is that, and, and this has implications for really the rest of the volume, the reason I call it the swinging moment is that it... I think that 66, 67 represents a kind of passing point at which the London economy was transforming rapidly from the old industrial economy I've highlighted into something more service-based. I'll go back to the uh, picture that uh, (coughs) came out a few minutes ago. Uh, This is a typing pool in an unidentified city office in the late 1970s, taken by the photographer Homer Sykes. Uh, If you wanted to sum up modern London in one word in the mid-60s or in throughout the 70s, you would say the office boom. Um, that counts for more, really, than any of the other features I've described already. It's a process uh, that generates enormous numbers of jobs, mostly for young people working in offices, uh, many of them female, as you can see, um, but not only women. Uh, It puts money into their pockets, and much of that money is blown on fashion and records and uh, swinging this generally. Um, It was real. As I said, I don't like to wish it away, but it it was not ephemeral. It was, though, transient. It was transient because in the long term, this process of adaptation moving from an industrial city to a largely service-based one, this process of adaptation was one that would leave victims in its wake. Uh, And I'll go on to talk later in this talk a, a little about who those victims are and what sort of stage of the process London was by the time London was at by the time I finished finished. So Keep that in your heads for the moment. The idea of a, a swinging moment rather than a kind of uh, endless swingingness that hit London in the mid 60s, made it the most attractive place to, particularly to foreign visitors, but also to visitors to the provinces, and also many Londoners themselves who were tasting the West End for the first time in many cases. Uh, made it an attractive process, uh, a place in the process, but could not ultimately last. So after this opening chapter, which is not an introduction per se, but rather a a kind of immersion in the developments of the mid-60s, after this opening chapter, I I move on to two chapters which in different ways demonstrate the evaporation of the more ephemeral sides of the 60s. I call those two chapters uh, the umbrella heading of the death of the 60s. The one which you all have been intrigued by the illustration that's been up for the last 90 seconds here. Uh, The one which I'm uh, advertising here, the second chapter in the book, looks at the rise and fall of Soho as a kind of centre of naughtiness in uh, in, in 60s London. Um, It was one of the features that most struck foreign observers of the whole swinging London phenomenon, that a place which they'd always thought of as being rather puritanical, uh, still rather Victorian, suddenly is given over to a kind of mushrooming uh, of the sex trade of strip clubs and so on. Uh, It's focused very strongly in Soho, um, and for that reason I devoted a chapter to the whole process. It's a kind of morality tale, an urban history morality tale, if you like, uh, describing the way in which this industry becomes dominant in a particular area. For the sake of uh, explanation, 
This is the Naked City strip club. Um, if the picture hadn't been cropped by uh, PowerPoint, uh, you'd be able to see in the, in the bottom right, I notice advertising Julie Field misspelt, um, Shiona Machen and uh, Bella Ragazzi, uh, in case the illustrations left visitors with any language barrier. And uh, it was emblematic of what was going on in this highly concentrated area of London. One reason for writing the book in the way that I have has been to allow me to take individual case studies of this sort and, and drill down into them. I don't think a narrative history could enable you to do that. So in this case, uh, in a chapter largely based on the rather straight-laced accounts of the London Metropolitan Archives of attempts to regulate this, I look at the uh, way in which strip and later dirty bookshops and to some extent dirty cinemas take over a whole area in part being encouraged to do so by the local authorities who didn't want this kind of thing spreading anywhere else until it gets to the point where the area was so tawdry as to become repellent uh, repellent to those who live there and many people did still live there um, and ultimately repellent to all but a certain type of tourists, whereupon you have a clean-up, whereupon you have uh, a, a very rapid about-turn in the last 70s and implicitly a rejection of the sort of what we call permissiveness that was taken to underlie the 60s social revolution. <clears throat> the next end of the 60s chapter looks at... The other end of the 60s chapter looks at the... Um, parallel rise and fall of the fashion trade, which is the other, I suppose, the other main distinguishing feature, or one other main distinguishing feature of the swinging London um, phenomenon. This is a picture. There's a Carnby Street boutique, I don't know which one, with a fisheye lens, um, an assistant selling a, a glorious tomato-coloured men's, uh, men's shirt, uh, and enough there, I think, to indicate how the whole colour revolution uh, drove uh, London's very rapid fashion uh, evolution in the mid-60s. But the chapter's not about that. We've got enough stuff written on Carnaby Street and so on. The chapter's rather about where fashion goes from there. Um, in the first place about the way in which the whole boutique model, which was ultimately pretty flawed, the whole boutique model collapses. Uh, too many people go into it without enough knowledge, without enough capital, vulnerable to very swift changes of fashion, which leave them with enormous amounts of stock on their hands, which they still have to pay for, and so on and so on. Um, I used in this, the, above all, the trade press of the Draper's Record, which catalogues the succession of rather gloomy bankruptcies suffered by uh, people who thought they could go into the boot boutique trade and print money. Um, <clears throat> One who did have both um, aesthetic and marketing nous uh, forms the main focus of this chapter, and, uh, and that is Barbara Huleneke, who is the founder of Bieber, which starts in uh, a small street in uh, just off High Street, Kensington, and expands to become, in effect, a kind of hippie department store. Uh, which you see illustrated here. This is the food hall, and this is a long way from a boutique. It's a long way from a, a Kensington boutique. A food hall with, um, as you, you see, dispensers uh, designed to uh, imitate Heinz cans, indeed uh, one with Warhol written as a kind of brand name on it, an image which you'll recognise. So Bieber goes the other way. It, it goes bigger and bigger and bigger, takes over what is now uh, well, part of the Barkers building in Kensington and eventually overreaches itself, uh, collapses in 1975, a point which is taken by many commentators as the, at the time as, quote, the death of the 60s. Um, and that's the kind of um, <coughs> umbrella label I use for these two case studies. That is all indicative of a, the way in which a kind of consumerism can uh, explode, collapse, um, consume itself, if you like. 
I was more interested, though, and I think um, of all the chapters I did, this is probably the, well, one of the two that engrossed me most, in, in something rather more emblematic of the modern consumer city, which really does get underway in the 1960s in London and does survive the more difficult economic climate of the 70s. That is eating out and the restaurant trade. Um, and I, I've got a chapter, the next chapter, which looks at that, the way in which London becomes, whether by accident or design, I don't quite know, but becomes a restaurant centre focusing not as a ki on the kind of imitation of Paris and the endless sort of refinement of the Escoffier tradition, but rather on diversity, on the encouragement of different types of taste experience, or whatever you want to call it, beginning uh, in the late 50s with the Trattoria uh, revolution and uh, mostly focused in Soho where there was a resident Italian community spreading eventually to Chelsea where the money was and throughout much of uh, central London after that. Uh, this is a picture of 1960 of the Trattoria del Tello. Um, I think apart from the cigarette vending machine and the advert for BEA, it could almost be, you know, almost be a modern uh, photo, but it is from 1960. Um, and it captures the type of experimental eating that was gaining ground in the 50s with uh, a, a vogue for Italian cuisine and subsequently for pretty well any other cuisine you like to mention. If you look through guidebooks, even from 1970, and if you're prepared to do your research, you can find you know, Thai and, and Korean and, and Japanese and so on. Not very many of them, but you can find them in London. You can find all the different variants of Chinese cuisine. Um, you can find Greek. Uh, this is the Venus Kebab House in Charlotte Street in Fitzrovia, which uh, becomes a kind of centre of, um, uh, of the Greek restaurant trade, I suppose. Uh, out of interest, uh, uh, in the background you can see Schmidt's German restaurant, which had been there since 1914 or something, survived two world wars, um, was a one-off. And in the background behind that, you can see the base of the post office tower. Um, you can also see an attempt at kind of Mediterranean dining, which is something that the Greek places were, kept, were quite keen on. But the, uh, i.e. sitting outside in the street, uh, which doesn't generally go down well in the, in the London climate, but was, uh, was tried wherever possible and, and became a feature of this type of restaurant. The, uh, the point of this chapter is to look at what the... Um, well, the two American economists, Pine and Gilmore, who coined the term experience economy, I, I think that captures exactly what's going on here. It's a level of the service sector beyond the obvious provision of necessary services. So beyond the provision of your typing pool in, in the city, which I showed earlier, beyond the provision of laundromats or, or garages or whatever, you have a, a sector of the service economy that exists just to provide people with experiences for the hell of it. And that is so much more aptly served, I think, by the profusion of different types of ethnic cuisine that we're seeing in London in this period than by uh, a million different French restaurants. <clears throat> but the ultimate consumer durable, as I call it, was the owner-occupied house. And there's a chapter on housing. There has to be a chapter on housing, I think, in any uh, city history. Uh, it focuses on the shift towards owner occupation, uh, which takes place in this period. For background, London's housing stock at the time I started was, uh, for the reasons I gave earlier, was in a pretty poor state. It was much of it was built before 1880. Much of it had been bomb damaged, of course. Much more of it had been damaged by years of rent control between the wars and, uh, again, after the Second World War, which acted as a disincentive for landlords to improve. So it was in a poor way. There were two ways of overhauling it. One which would have seen the dominant way for much of the 60s was local authority slum clearance and redevelopment. The other 
was um, what I loosely call gentrification. I start, I'll start with this picture of the Samudra estate in Tower Hamlets because I think the photographer John Gay, who took a lot of pictures in the book, uh, or, or a lot of his pictures I've used, um, <coughs> is, well, he's conscious of the possibility of making this kind of architecture look attractive, and I think that's important. We have to remember how, and, and as, as one who's been through London photographic collections looking at uh, the condition of areas that were cleared, I know how, uh, how low some of those areas had sunk. And although we tend now to turn our noses up at this kind of development, um, for those who moved into it when it was brand new, it was um, Desiree's uh, state of the art. And that was seen as the dominant approach to the housing crisis, and it was a crisis in the early 60s. At the same time, though, you're seeing what I described as gentrification. Now, I'll dwell on that term a bit. This photograph shows the actor Susanna York decorating her newly acquired home in Seaton Street in Chelsea in 1960. That street becomes the focus of a kind of battle, a publicity battle, between what we'd have to call gentrifying residents, um, who had moved into some very beautiful early 19th century cottages, or larger, I think they're three-story, in fact, um, <clears throat> which were then to be cleared by the London County Council for the World's End Estate at the end of the King's Road in Chelsea. Um, so this, as you can see, the sort of elbow grease she's putting into it, sweat equity, as the geographers call it. Um, this and the other houses in the street, one of them occupied by Robin Norm, brother of Somerset Norm, and a writer in his own right, the, these places become the kind of focus of a kind of public-private battle um, between municipalities and what are loosely called gentrifiers, and I'm sure, as you'll gather, I'm cautious about using the term. In this case, the gentrifiers lost, but steadily over the period I'm describing, the 60s and 70s, A, local authorities retreat from this sort of battle, or try to avoid picking the fight in the first place, B, increasingly the money for public social housing is just not there and central government is becoming more and more reluctant to provide it in London because of the cost of land, because of the cost of building labour, and so on. So that by the mid-60s, before Thatcher, before Right to Buy, and uh, any of those conscious policy initiatives designed to tilt the balance, you're getting de facto encouragement towards private ownership. And the reason I hesitate to talk of this as gentrification is because it, it is a lot larger than that. It's not just TV producers and advertising executives buying up the little cottages of, um, uh, of dustmen and uh, dockers or what have you and putting in running water and inside toilets and so on. It's, it's not that kind of very extreme Chelsea, Notting Hill type of process, um, but rather it is a gradual regeneration, piecemeal regeneration of much of the existing housing stock by private capital. And ultimately, that is what uh, wins out, I think, in, uh, in housing terms. So that by the end of the period, you've got something like, well, over 50% of the housing stock is owner-occupied. Um, somewhere around a third is, housing, is, is social housing, and the rest is a rapidly dwindling private rental sector, the real uh, victims of this process. And following on from this discussion of housing, I've got a couple of chapters on what you might call the urban fabric. One deals with, and it relates again to the uh, value accorded to the house, one deals with the defeat of proposals for three concentric orbital urban motorways in the 1970s, which are defeated not necessarily because people don't like the car, though many people don't, not necessarily because they're not needed, though arguably they were, I mean, that's questionable, but uh, arguably they were, but I think are primarily defeated on environmentalist, conservationist grounds uh, in the early 1970s. 
because in various sort of inchoate ways, a very large number of people are now objecting to that sort of large-scale tampering with the urban environment. This picture here relates to the following chapter, which deals with the growth of the conservation movement and the formation of what I call a conservation consensus, which may be a contentious claim, but I'm making it. Uh, it shows the um, a stage in the demolition of the Euston Arch, the Doric Arch that had uh, acted as a kind of gateway to the old Euston Station, something which would be absolutely untouchable now, but was uh, brought down in 1961 uh, and became a, a sort of symbol of uh, the... Uh, preservation or otherwise of London's um, established fabric. It was, I mean, I still, I still regard this as a tragedy. I, I, I think um, you, <coughs> I, I mean, it's, it's inconceivable that it would have been demolished today, utterly inconceivable. It would have been grade one listed, it would have been untouchable. In the course of the 20 odd years I'm describing, Attitudes shifted, in part as a result of cause célèbre like this, um, and in part as a rejection of the whole ethos of modernist planning. I've often asked myself, without being able to answer, what if the people who sought to redevelop London in the 60s had... A, an aesthetic comparable to that of Baron Ausmann and the uh, developers of Paris in the 1850s and 60s. What, in other words, if we had actually liked the end product, if the public had liked the end product more than they did? This picture shows the second of three proposals for the redevelopment of Piccadilly Circus, right at the heart of the capital. Um, there's a lot that you could say about this, and I, I, I will be brief, but uh, uh, it embodies, above all, planning principles ahead of any visible aesthetic ones that I can identify. Uh, the most important planning principle here is the uh, vogue for the separation of pedestrians and traffic. You can see, if you look at the bottom right-hand corner, a road going under the proposed new piazza with Eros sitting on top of the piazza um, with a bus on that road. All of this uh, reflecting what had become a kind of dominant urban ethos that cities should be reconstructed to separate pedestrians and traffic physically uh, in order to enhance the flow of traffic and reduce the danger and discomfort to pedestrians. That's the idea. Um, the designer of this, Sir William Holford, I think, like many people who are essentially trained as town planners, had little obvious aesthetic sense. I think this is a real mess. There may be you know, others here, who, people here who disagree with that, but I, I think this is a complete jumble, and anything that looks as bad as this in an architectural drawing is going to look a hell of a lot worse if you actually bring it into being. There are three case studies within this chapter that I look at. The successive attempts to remodel Piccadilly, uh, the proposals for Whitehall, which have had a very good study in their own right by Sharon Thornton, and the proposals for the um, remodeling of Covent Garden, um, none of which happened, all of which swallowed up a large amount of public money and time, even in the, even in the planning stage. Um, and all of which helped sharpen and focus a debate over what the city should look like and what in the old city should be retained. At the end of that chapter, I cite a correspondence between Nicholas Pevsner as chairman of the Victorian Society and a man called Anthony Dale at the Ministry of Housing and Local Government over the fate of this building, which is number 33 to 5 East Cheap in the city of London, built as a vinegar warehouse in the 1860s by the Victorian architect R.O. Rumiu, uh, in which Pevsner says, in effect, look, this is a bit daft, but it's, uh, it's fun and it should be listed. And Dale says, if we list things like this, we will make a laughing stock of ourselves. Uh, this is just not uh, the kind of thing that listing is designed for. A discussion, a, a, an exchange which illustrates the uh, 
difference in value, I think, between a conservationist, and Pevsner was an enthusiast for modernism, of course, but a conservationist, uh, as Pevsner was in part, um, and somebody still with a rather dated um, view of listing as a means of protecting gems like St Paul's Cathedral or whatever, not uh, protecting townscapes. And whereas the, <coughs> in every way, much more important Euston Arch was demolished, this, um, which is a modern picture, it's the only modern picture in the book from 2007, uh, this survives to this day. Uh, and if you wanted to build a commercial building in the city, you wouldn't make it look like this. You wouldn't adapt an old vinegar warehouse. <laughs> um, but that's what happened. And, and it is effectively ring fence now. Now there's a gear shift, and I warned you that the chapters are, uh, you know, this isn't a narrative history, the chapters don't necessarily um, flow one to the other, and, and try as I might, I couldn't find an obvious link uh, from uh, chapter eight to chapter, uh, chapter seven to chapter eight. Um, this, the next chapter looks at the East End. Uh, there is a slight link in that it's still looking at questions of redevelopment. This, um, for those below a certain age and uh, hadn't realised that Docklands once contained docks, this is the Isle of Dogs, uh, the, the bulbous southern end of the borough of Tower Hamlets, uh, which was a dockland containing docks, and you can see the docks, the Millwall docks, the um, East to West India docks uh, in Dockland. Um, north of it is really, I suppose, the main focus of the, of the chapter, um, that's what docks like, look like, and this is what dockers looked like uh, in 1965. Um, <clears throat> an, old, uh, an old population, as you can see. I mean, this, in a sense, this could be a Victorian picture, except for the dress. But uh, these are people now who are relatively prosperous. Their jobs are protected by the dock labour scheme introduced by the Attlee government. Um, and they do an awful lot of half-inching of stuff that comes into the port. Uh, so the East End becomes a kind of um, uh, well, a sort of illicitly prosperous place in the 1960s, but it is still a very shabby place, a very grimy place, and a place which suffered enormously during the war. Uh, so the area to the east of the um, aerial view that I, to, sorry, to the north of the aerial view that I just showed, uh, becomes the subject of a redevelopment proposal well before the familiar Docklands redevelopment. That is a, the largest comprehensive development area, CDA, uh, to be proposed and implemented in Britain, the so-called Stepney Poplar uh, development area, um, which is an attempt to modernise the area whilst keeping its essential character. Uh, which I think is, a, is probably a rather quixotic enterprise, but um, was nonetheless what was being attempted. That is to provide modern houses for the population instead of slums, to provide new churches, schools, pubs, whatever, uh, as part of a lengthy process of, of redevelopment. And it is lengthy, and that is the problem. As much as anything else, that is the problem. Um, this, I love this picture, actually. The publisher's, the publisher's art man didn't, but uh, I love this picture. But it, whether you like it or not, it tells you, it does tell a story. Uh, this is the Stifford estate in Stepney, which replaced some utterly appalling uh, um, areas in the um, Clive Street area of Stepney. Uh, three 17-storey tower blocks completed in, I think, about 1962. Um, <clears throat> this is then either uh, at the moment of completion or just before it. But the point of this picture is to demonstrate that the process of this kind of progressive and, uh, and well-meaning redevelopment created a kind of wasteland that lasted for decades. And in the meantime, those in the East End who could get out, those who didn't like living in the sort of wasteland you see in the foreground here, did so. And the area leeches population in a very big way. This produces a kind of imbalance which ultimately, I think, makes it more or less ungovernable. You have 
and this worried the local authorities at the time, you have the most productive elements in the population going off to Romford or Basildon or wherever, uh, and only those who couldn't move, usually because they were too old or unemployed or, or, or what have you, um, were, were staying. It becomes a kind of unbalanced area and attempts to correct that. And Tower Hamlets in particular, and Newham as well, throw enormous amounts of money at social housing in the 60s and 70s. Attempts to correct that ultimately fail for the reason that so much local authority um, housing was failing in this period that central government was becoming increasingly reluctant to underwrite the bill. Um, the, the level of the rates, local taxation, Tower Hamlets, really goes through the roof. And in the process, the traditional post-war and indeed late 19th century idea of the local authority as an agent for the social modernisation of, of an area um, goes by the board, uh, becomes unmanageable. Amongst those who leave the East End for Romford, Basel and so on, um, one conspicuous group that I devote a whole chapter to is that of the London taxi drivers. Uh, this is maybe not, this is a slightly off message illustration of uh, uh, the result of a kind of fracas between taxi drivers and the minicab driver uh, once minicabs were allowed onto the streets of London in the early 60s. But the chapter looks at the evolution of, um, uh, of this particular occupational group very rapidly from being a kind of um, uh, proletarianized and pretty left-wing group, including large numbers of Jewish communists in their ranks, ranks of all senses, um, to into something more like um, entrepre small entrepreneurs, uh, self-made men, owner-drivers, moving out to the suburbs, and ultimately, um, by the late 70s, declaring their support for Mrs. Thatcher and we have to assume, because they say so, becoming more and more likely to vote Conservative. It's a process in the formation of what we once knew as knew of as Essex men and indeed the, um, the chapter title is The London Cabbie and, uh, and the um, Growth of Essex Man or something like that. Um, <clears throat> And it's an idiosyncratic form of suburbanisation, but one which tells you something about the transformation of the old London working class from that to something very different. The next chapter looks more directly at the outer, at the outer suburbs and their evolution in the 70s. Uh, this is uh, the, I, I thought, comes from the London Metropolitan Archives collage collection, the ultimate suburban photograph. It's got everything. It's got your lawn. It's got, and got garden gnomes. It's got um, a lawn with topiary. It's got an oddly bucolic garage on the left. It's got half timbering. It's got pebble dash. Uh, this is Pinner. This is West End Lane in Pinner in the mid 70s in London Borough of Harrow in, uh, in the northwest of London. The focus of this chapter is on the suburban house, the suburban householder, and the increasing determination which suburbanites, with which suburbanites sought to protect their homes and their environment from the threats of development, uh, the modernisation of town centres in places like Kingston or Richmond or wherever, um, and from the, th the threat to individual buildings in their streets, which were not sufficiently distinguished to be listed, but which they still preferred to whatever was likely to replace them. Uh, so there is, a, again, a clear sort of conservationist drive going on here. But on top of that, and what gives it a real political edge, is uh, an increasingly militant opposition, both to the socialism that they see as coming out of the Labour-controlled Greater London Council, metropolitan body, in the 1970s, mid-1970s, um, and to <coughs> the apparently relentless escalation of local taxation, um, which produces a succession of grassroots movements in the suburbs aimed at bringing about a change in the system of local taxation. Indeed, I did find in Bromley, in my research in the Bromley archives, somebody actually calling for the introduction of a poll tax. Get rid of the property-based rates 
and produce something which is less clearly aimed at householders. Um, and that development of a sort of sharpening, anti-socialist, home-based uh, suburban conservatism is something I think is very significant. Another gear change, um, two chapters on race, important, obviously, in any account of London. They both focus on the Afro-Caribbean community. Um, the first, which is actually quite hard to illustrate, but uh, the first looks at the reaction to the famous, notorious Notting Hill race riots in 1958, uh, the formation, which is a kind of... Um, uh, defensive reaction on the part of uh, London's white liberals and black organisations themselves to promote friendship, reconciliation, councils and so on. Um, and, and this is really the focus of the chapter, to try and cultivate a kind, what I call a race etiquette. The sense which does take root in the 60s, I think, that even if you're going to say something really racist, it should be prefaced by, well, yeah, I'm not racist, but, or some of my best friends are black people, but, blah, 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 and so on. And this enjoyed a degree of success against the backdrop of American cities going up in flames uh, as a result of racial conflict. This produced a degree of success in containing potential racial tensions, at least until... 1968, when a lot goes wrong, including Enoch Powell's uh, celebrated so-called Rivers of Blood speech. The next, the second of the two chapters looks at the, the way in which this sort of delicate consensus collapses as a result of, on the one hand, the, the deepening problems in the London economy, on the other hand, the emergence of a black generation which is either born in Britain or raised in Britain from a very young age. This photograph is a wonderful picture from uh, Colin Jones's wonderful photo essay for the Sunday Times in 1973. Shows two um, black youths who lived in the hostel called Harambee, which Jones made the focus of his study, one of a number of hostels set up as the self-help agencies by the black community for young blacks who had, in most cases, been alienated from their parents, um, part of the result of their failure to get jobs and so on, finding themselves on the streets. On the streets, of course, they encounter the Metropolitan Police, um, who are generally not well disposed towards them, generally inclined to be suspicious of uh, their motives, uh, to assume that they're dealing in drugs or, or whatever. Um, and this produced a level of friction between the Met and uh, a largely British-born young black community who are encountering both severe prejudice and uh, a very difficult employment uh, situation by the mid-70s. After a number of uh, really bitter, embittered episodes, most obviously the furore over the mangrove trial in 1971, after a number of embittered episodes, the police sort of step back and try and <coughs> devise means of reconciliation, uh, focusing in particular on the Notting Hill Carnival, uh, which they see as a means of encouraging good relations between uh, the Blacks of North West London and the Metropolitan Police. This actually comes from the 1977 carnival, but the chapter is about the kind of Shakespearean tragedy that emerges in 1976, when on the one hand you have the Met trying to uh, use the carnival as a, as a form of reconciliation. On the other hand, it is expanding very rapidly as it is changed into a kind of pan-Caribbean and pan-London festival uh, with sound systems replacing steel drums and so on. Um, it culminates in the rioting at the 1976 festival, graphically captured in, here in one of the uh, Getty images that I used, um, 
And you can see a policeman on the left sheltering or ducking from something. A policeman with the truncheon who appears to be coming straight from the, for the photographer and may, may well have been uh, slightly less obvious, but a black man is being bundled, one assumes being bundled into the van and so on. This was an episode that's rather sort of disappeared from view, but it clearly foreshadows the still worse rioting of 1981 and 1985, not only in London but in a number of cities. Uh, and it was, as I say, there's something sort of Shakespearean about it, that it's the result of a number of processes, each of which makes sense in its own right, uh, but which together produce a, an ultimately tragic situation. Um, and that is the focus of the second of the, of the race chapters. Um, I've got two chapters next which look at the gradual erosion of what you might call the post-war consensus. The first of them, again rather hard to illustrate, traces the sidestepping of conventional local authority social services, first by the emergence of a kind of new voluntary sector, groups like Shelter and Release, the Drugs Charity and so on, um, which, are, um, which aim to deal with problems which the welfare state doesn't actually tackle very well. Secondly, by a form of the emergence of a kind of grassroots ad hoc form of politics called itself community politics. And that's what's really being illustrated here. It's the uh, graffiti in front of um, a squat in Lambeth somewhere. I think the Villa Road squat in Brixton, I'm not sure. Um, and it shows uh, the local authorities picking up Homeless people, I think that's what one infers from the sign, which is half cut off on the left, um, dumping them in a pot marked um, problem families, isn't it? Yeah, problem families, etc. Uh, <clears throat> whilst at the same time you have prostitution and meth drinkers on the streets on the right. Um, this kind of ad hoc process, protest initially sort of distances itself from the Labour Party and seeks to, local Labour parties and seek to supply, to, seeks to ignore them, um, largely because they're seen as kind of too old, too blue collar, too socially conservative. But by the late seventies, they are beginning to make their way into Labour organisations with dramatic transformative effects. This is what I call it in the book. I call it old Labour at play. Um, it's a picture of a wheelbarrow race, as you can see, um, obviously. Uh, a wheelbarrow race at the Poplar Labour Party Women's Section um, AGM in 1960, early 1960s. The precise date isn't known. Uh, it shows the... Uh, it shows, uh, Labour Party and its old guys as a kind of associational and um, pleasure-giving institution. By the end of the 70s, you've got this. This is Reg Prentice, uh, former minister in the Wilson Callaghan governments, who comes under fire from his own local party association in Newham North East, and this is the meeting at which he is deselected, at least uh, not adopted as candidate for the next election, which will take place in 1979. He subsequently defects to the Conservative Party. Um, Labour, local Labour parties, particularly in the inner city, have become a mixture of old blue-collar workers, often, as I say, with very social conservative, socially conservative opinions, of uh, often quite sort of um, bien pensant professionals, it might be anything, lawyers, um, uh, management consultants, whatever, of a progressive bent, and a large group of public sector teachers, social workers, whatever, who often have been um, marked by the ideological movements of the late 60s and positioned themselves on the far left. Um, it's, it's lazily termed entryism uh, by press at the time and some people since. It's not really that. It's a kind of concatenation of very different attitudes towards what a progressive party should be doing, which brings a number of episodes like this. Prentice wasn't the only one. Um, by any means, there are about half a dozen instances of MPs perceived to be on the right of the party coming under pressure. Finally, you'll be relieved to hear, I've got two chapters which look at the, the transformation that's been underlying all I've been describing. The first of them looks at tourism. The reason for that is that 
tourism above all else marks the the modern or postmodern city, uh, not just in London but elsewhere. Um, and London becomes the first place in Britain really to build tourism into its economy, but it does so almost by accident and certainly reluctantly. Um, initially, it's a consequence of the whole Carnaby Street phenomenon. This is, uh, these are the two sides of a postcard which I bought on eBay uh, while I was actually searching for illustrations for the book. It's a postcard of Carnaby Street uh, with the, the writing saying, Bonjour de Londres, uh, 1969 sent to uh, an address in Brussels um, and initially tourism is kind of ad hoc it grows out of the whole magnetism of the Carnaby Street swinging London phenomenon and initially the reaction of the authorities is to spurn it and say you know we don't want this is putting too much pressure on resources on transport on accommodation on hotels etc we can't we can't handle it um, gradually as the London economy the, industri the old industrial economy falters and in many areas collapses, the tourist is welcomed. And the last chapter begins with the whole catastrophic impact of deindustrialization in the inner city from the late 60s onwards. This picture dates from 73. It shows the Surrey docks, uh, the docks on the south side of the river, not in the photo I showed earlier. Um, a derelict or abandoned, I should say, lorry half uh, tilting into the water um, some six years or so after the docks had closed. Uh, it, this, uh, the images like it give rise to a, a wave of declinism which sweeps the city in the mid-70s, sweeps the press anyway in the mid-70s, um, and creates the impression that London is really a city on the ropes it isn't, um, and this picture, which for anyone like me who comes from South East London, a train delayed at, uh, uh, and grew up in this period, train delayed at Charing Cross of the effect that it gets absolutely swamped by commuters, an indication of how active the city still was for those who were in the right business, the right profession. Um, what we're seeing is a kind of substantial and in some ways painful sectoral shift, a move away from an old industrial city to something that is very different, that is based on services, on consumerism, on hedonism in some respects, um, but is very different from the London of the 1950s. And when I stood back from all of this and asked what on earth this is about, um, I realised that what I'd been describing was a kind of a process which anticipated in all manner of ways what we know of as Thatcher's Britain, the Britain of the 1980s. It had, and I'll look here at the notes because I haven't got a, I can't really illustrate with the picture, but in the first place you've got deindustrialization as I just showed you, combined with the kind of consumerism that has been running throughout this talk, what you see, and I, I, I'll, go, I'll tread lightly on this, but what you see is a pattern which becomes very familiar in the 1980s of the very well-off doing well, the median incomes actually weathering the storm, even the inflationary storm of the 70s, pretty well. People's real incomes are rising in the medium of the distribution, but at the bottom, you have a, a real collapse. I mean, that, that will be the pattern in Britain throughout the 80s. The lowest quartile of London incomes, uh, having kept, track, kept pace with everyone else up until about 1967, tails off. You see a 12% real terms reduction in the income of the lowest uh, income groups in London, the lowest quartile of income groups in London in the uh, period from about 67 to 79 when the book ends. This creates an intense minority poverty um, which most people just bear in the same way as many people are just bearing intense poverty now, but where it intersects with a sense of racial exclusion, discrimination, as I described earlier, that can lead to a serious public order challenge, anticipating, as I said, the riots of the early 80s. 
At the same time, you see the unwinding of many central aspects of the old paternalistic post-war welfare state as prosperity grew. And I've described these already, the capping and ultimate restriction of social housing, the curtailment of local government activities in the social policy area, um, and so on. You see at the same time the discombobulation of local labor parties that I described, uh, <clears throat> with obvious political effects through their own internal strife. You see the transformation of a section of the working class and the taxi drivers I focused on, a section of the working class into suburban entrepreneurial Thatcherites. Not necessarily very prosperous, not necessarily very secure, but nonetheless individualistic increasingly in their outlook. You see conservationism. Might not sound like a very Thatcherite phenomenon, but... Uh, John Pendlebury, in his excellent book on the conservation movement in Britain, rightly says that the 1980s is the golden age for conservation in Britain. And that's anticipated uh, in London in the 1960s and 70s and embodies that rejection of 60s planning and planners of modernist architecture and so on, the whole ethos. And you even see a number of small but significant pointers to the 1980s, that the abolition of the Greater London Council is first mooted following the failure of their motorway schemes in 1973. Um, and as I suggested earlier, you have an attack on the rates, the local taxation system, and even there came across one proposal for a poll tax. So all of this is actually very evocative of what will happen to Britain as a whole in the 1980s, but Margaret Thatcher had nothing to do with it. She wasn't responsible for the, for the uh, prosperity. She wasn't responsible for the poverty. She wasn't responsible for the race riots. She wasn't responsible for the undermining of the Labour Party. Uh, she wasn't responsible, though she's doubtless sympathetic, um, to uh, the... Uh, demonization of planners. Uh, she wasn't even responsible for that, the emergence of that sharp edged suburban conservatism that I described, even though she clearly benefited from it and could have identified with it. So she had nothing to do with it, but it happens nonetheless. Um, there's no reason in all of this to undermine her image as a kind of um, uh, shape shifting and, and, uh, and age changing politician. Um, she is still a massively important figure, but it's, it's vital to realise how much of the groundwork in Britain's central uh, social and economic hub had effectively been done before she became uh, a really active political force. And the last sentence of the book, in the last sentence of the book, I say that it was necessary for the Ancien Regime to crumble before there could be a revolution. And by that I mean that the old post-war certainties collapsed before an identifiable individual in Margaret Thatcher came to pull them down. So I will leave it at that. I'd be happy to take any questions if anyone still has any, um, <laughs> any energy to, to ask them. Thank you so much for that uh, fascinating overview, John. Um, we'll just take a question from Slido first, if that's all right, because I've got one up here. Um, the question was, uh, why was London special in the 60s? Or rather, were there other cities with similar movements, for example, Paris? Mm, um, it is special. I, th I think it's special in that the emphasis is so heavily on the cultural side. There's, there's no obvious underlying politics. In fact, I find it very difficult to say what the politics of swinging London in the 60s was. Um, a number of the more prominent uh, movers and shakers of the swinging London phenomenon uh, were actually, as far as one could tell, were actually conservative. Though the assumption at the time was that this was in some way a kind of mould-breaking movement and therefore it must be radical. Uh, it's, it's difficult to identify a clear kind of radical drive in figures like 
Mary Quant and so on. Uh, many of them were uh, very critical of the Labour government at the time. Many of them were, uh, particularly because they were self-made, uh, the, the successful figures in this cultural revolution. Many of them were very critical of 60s levels of taxation and so on. Um, so, but they were not going to identify with the Conservative Party of Harold Macmillan and Alec, Alec Douglas Hume or even Edward Heath. Uh, that, that was just beyond the pale. Uh, too much damage had been done by satire and, uh, and by its own political um, missteps uh, for that to happen. So I, I don't... I mean, of course, I've, I've only really studied London. Um, I don't, I can't easily identify any other city that goes through anything quite like the, uh, with, with quite the same mix that I described in London, I put it that way. Thank you. Anyone? Yeah? Uh, thank you very much indeed for, okay. the, uh, for the talk. Um, like yourself, I, I grew up in south-east London and my, my parents um, had a habit of going to different parts of South London generally in the winter. And I remember the date of about 1963 as being rather significant. The, the reason for that is that one came back having heard Beatles music all mm. over the place. <clears throat> mm. And that led me to the thought that perhaps this was um, an importation of US culture mm. in a form that could be reflected back successfully to America. And I wondered how much um, the, the, your, the development of London you've talked about is, is related to an overall uh, absorption of, of American culture and yeah, even good. Americanization. <coughs> it's an important question. I'd, I've always thought that, and you know, I was at primary school in 1963. One reason why I'm so reluctant to dispel the whole idea of swinging London is that I remember how much of an impact Beatlemania made even on seven-year-olds. Um, <coughs> I, what I'd always say about that phenomenon is that, yes, they were all the Beatles, the Stones, etc., were all directly influenced by the US, but what they did with the music produced something that could then be exported back, and of course was, um, that if they'd just been imitators, then the Beatles wouldn't have had the same impact as they did when they went on their 1964 American tour, which was phenomenal. Um, and I, I did. It was a kind of jeu d'esprit and um, only a sideline, but about 10 years ago now I wrote something about the impact of British beat music in continental Europe, um, which produced a kind of slavish imitation. I mean, what were in effect tribute bands uh, emerging in France, Germany, the Scandinavian countries, and the Netherlands, and so on. Uh, singing English songs, even though they, in most cases, couldn't actually speak or necessarily even understand English. So, uh, and you're not getting that in the US. You're getting, you're, you're getting a more um, a symbiotic sort of uh, cultural exchange going on there. There's, there's no doubt that uh, Britain remains very open to American music throughout the, throughout the period. Um, but equally, I think there's no doubt that what is coming over from the States after about 65 has itself been influenced by what was done in, in Britain. And I do, I think this is an important question. I sort of wrestled with this um, for quite a long time when I was writing, because the, the thing I was writing was for a collection on Americanization. And to me, it was significant that what you saw in Europe was just the kind of process of, of imitation, whereas what you see across the, in the transatlantic um, interaction was, was far more one of mutual exchange. So I'd, I'd put it that way, I think. But yes, I'd, I'd take the point, yeah. Thank you very much. Fascinating talk, and I can't wait to read the book, if only to see the amazing collection of illustrations. Yes, <laughs> assembled. Well, there, there are sure. 70 in all, and there are only 33 in this. I mean, yeah. Really wonderfully chosen. Um, one of the earliest illustrations was of the office scene, with, yes. with, with yeah. the, um, the secretaries all clustered together. And, of course, underlying that was the huge property boom 
that resulted in the need for service sector office accommodation, mm. which was transformed the urban landscape yeah. and also made certain individuals extremely rich. Yes. Um, I wondered if, I know you've got a very broad canvas, I wonder if you yeah. touch on that. And also, yeah. I was thinking perhaps of one of the symbols of that, of course, was Centrepoint, yes. which, uh, which yeah. became empty yeah. for years and became yeah. a sort of, you know, a sort of symbol of profligate kind of property development yeah. which, which had gone mad. Yeah, just so. Um, there, there is a certain amount in the first chapter about the property phenomenon. Um, it, it was one which benefited a relatively small group of people who'd had the sense to um, buy into London property when it was still cheap in the immediate post-war years, and in some cases during the war. Uh, essentially taking a punt on the outcome of the war <clears throat> so that when uh, when the war was won and slowly uh, the early restrictions on commercial development were lifted during the 50s until they're sort of reimposed under the Labour government in 65, uh, those who had the foresight or gambler's instinct to invest in that property did very well indeed. They included Harry Hyams, Oldham's, Oldham Estates, uh, who was the owner of Centrepoint, who built it kept it empty in effect because its value would continue to, uh, to rise and it could be used as security for loans um, until such point as he was more or less forced to, um, to let it. I, somewhere uh, in my uh, late mother's London house, uh, there's some pictures I took at the time when Centrepoint was actually squatted an unusual example of a non-residential squat, in fact, which was done for political reasons. Um, in about 1973, I think, at the height of the um, uh, speculative bubble. It's a background, it's a context to the conservation battles that I described, that uh, up until the property bubble burst in the winter of 73 4 it, there was a strong underlying threat to the existing um, urban fabric, or whatever you want to call it, coming from the sheer commercial rewards to be gained from redevelopment, even if redevelopment left those buildings empty, as in the case of Centre Point. Uh, after 73 4, and I, I discuss this in more detail in the conservation chapter. After 73 4, you do see a movement even within the developers' uh, ranks to um, refurbish existing buildings rather than to pull them down, um, partly prompted, I think, by a sense of political hostility. Um, but up until about 73 4, they do look to be, from, well, from the late, so from about 66 to uh, 73 4, they look to be the masters of the universe, those people. Uh, it's a small group, but um, they carried immense clout by virtue of their possession of freeholds of potentially very valuable land. And their ability to do kind of sweetheart deals with local authorities, to learn to play the planning system, to offer to provide facilities of one sort or another in return for planning permission and so on, and they do this with some skill, creating the sense that a small group of people with a, a very strong commercial incentive were reshaping the urban environment for everyone, um, which you know, I would say is socially undesirable, and certainly was said to be socially undesirable at the time. And this becomes... Uh, a cause which is taken up not just by those on the left and the far left who have a well-developed critique of, of, um, of property capitalism, but by many people who simply don't want to see their local environment messed around with. And that also applies in what they call the town centres and the suburbs as well, uh, less dramatically perhaps. Might take another question online then. Um, it's, I'm interested in how you've segmented the book. If you had to choose one chapter that has the strongest message about change, which one would it be? Ooh, um, I suppose the, yeah, there's change and change in this book, that's why I'm hesitating. Um, so 
I might direct people to the chapter on restaurants. I might direct them to the chapter on taxi drivers, which I've always liked, because that, that shows change happening within a group of people uh, over a relatively short space of time. Um, overall, I'd have to point them towards the concluding chapter, I think, because that does look at the impact of deindustrialization, which hangs really over not the whole book, but large parts of it. It looks at the impact of deindustrialization, but also the way in which a kind of nascent consumerism has bedded down um, and the sorts of conflicts that, and, and conclusions that, uh, and, and reconciliations, as it were, that result from that. So uh, I said at the start, you could choose which chapters to read and which ones to ignore. Um, if you only wanted one, <laughs> I, I would guide you to the last one uh, because I think actually it is, even though it does look back to a lot of what's gone before, it is comprehensible in its own right. Um, when you come to uh, prepare the second edition of this book, and I do hope there is one. It just sounds absolutely fabulous. Um, would you consider doing a chapter on the music scene on its own? Um, the straight answer is no, for one very specific reason. That, uh, and I'll, I'll, this is an indirect plug here, not for me, but um, my colleague Simon Gunn uh, at Leicester University, also now recently retired, is planning a whole book on 60s music, which I think is a massively understudied um, phenomenon, that we, we have any number of <coughs> academic books on punk, um, whose impact I think was sort of intense but limited. Um, and we really lack a, a single... Um, serious directed volume on, on the 60s scene. So uh, the answer is no, because I know somebody else is going to do it, is going to do it at greater length and is probably going to do it better than I could. Um, <coughs> though I did enjoy researching and writing about music when I was writing the piece I mentioned earlier. Um, and of course, anyone like anyone of my age, which is now 66, I was absolutely steeped in uh, the British music of the 60s from uh, 63 to whenever. Um, so I, I, I would enjoy it if I had to do it there. There are certainly other, there are other things that if... I mean, the thing's already 200,000 words long, um, which is why I stress that you don't have to read a whole lot of it to understand it. Uh, it's already 200,000 words long, so the publisher might give me dirty looks if I, um, if I propose to make it even longer. Though I haven't, I haven't been subject to any kind of... Um, pressure constraints from uh, publishers uh, for a change, uh, not from this one. Um, there, there are other things I'd like. I'd love to have done something on commuting. Uh, I think commuting is so important in London. Uh, it's not necessarily an easy thing to research, but then some of the other things I didn't look very easy when I started, but turned out to be doable. Uh, I would love to have done that. I certainly felt, with hindsight, that. I wished I'd had a chapter on what was referred to just now, the whole um, office economy, uh, and particularly focusing on the secretary. Because the secretary is an extremely important figure in 1960s London. She is, and it is normally a she, of course, she is sought after. She is actually inordinately well paid very often for the skills she had. Um, again, I don't think it would have been an easy thing to research, but... Again, I think it would have been doable. I think if, if Princeton were to come to me and say, right, let's have another edition. Um, uh, but we've had a flood of complaints from uh, all over the globe saying that, you, you know, you need more chapters, it's not long enough, uh, then um, that's, uh, that's only 200,000 words. Uh, then I think those two subjects would be the next things I would do. I, I wouldn't do something on the city because it's been very well done by... And by that, I mean the, the economy of the city, the square mile, the, the financial sector. It's been very well done by other people. I would have nothing to add. Um, I'm conscious that it's a big gap in the book, 
though not as big a gap as if the book had been dealing with the 80s and 90s, of course, but it's, it's a gap in the book, but it's just not something I feel equipped to do. And I'm aware that other people have already covered the both social and financial policy in the city a lot better than I have. I've always I've worked from from the start in the knowledge that this could not be a comprehensive history of 60s and 70s London. Um, I'm doubtful as to whether such a thing can be written. If it can, I don't think I could do it. But there are areas, and I appreciate your question, actually, there are areas where um, I, I would enjoy... I'd love to get back into the, some... You know, some uh, fresh areas of research and the ones I've mentioned I think would be tempting me but but probably not music for the same reason as not the city that uh, it will be done better by other people well if that's the last question I have no more from online either um, we just say thank you again for uh, coming to the Cambridge Festival and giving such a wonderful overview of your research and uh, such a beautifully illustrated, as also has been mentioned by the audience already. So if you'd just give another round of applause. Thank you.